Thank you so much for taking care of the baby for a whole year. Her words were light, as if we had parted only yesterday, carrying no weight at all. Immediately after, I heard Robert's voice from afar. I'm coming to pick the baby up now. I responded with a deliberately cold tone. Huh? What are you talking about? I don't know anything about that child. This was a line I had practiced over and over. I had thought I would have the chance to say it much earlier. It was unbelievable that they had left their child and not contacted me for a whole year. We left the baby at the front door, did we? Amiria seemed completely unaware of the gravity of the situation. I carefully repeated the rehearsed line to keep the conversation natural. What are you talking about? I'm not the one you entrusted your daughter Emily with. Don't you remember that? The long-awaited moment had finally arrived. It was time for her to reflect and regret deeply. I, Molly, am 51 years old. My husband passed away at the end of last year. We were both remarried. My son had already been independent and living in the city when we got married. Amiria, my husband's daughter, was 17 at that time, and while her troublesome teenage years worried me, she welcomed me as a new member of her family. Molly, would you use this lipstick? It came in a lucky bag, but I think this color suits you better than me. Amiria's friendly approach made me feel saved. The days spent with my new family were undoubtedly my true happiness. However, Twelve years later, after fighting his illness bravely, my husband ended his painful struggle without regaining his health and passed away. At his funeral, relatives including my son gathered, and my sister Lily gently stroked my back as I felt deeply saddened. Lily and I are identical twins, sharing not only looks but also profound empathy and comfort. After the funeral, my son, busy with work, had to leave immediately. Meanwhile, Amiria and her husband Robert, who live near my house, willingly took on the task of sorting out the house and disposing of my husband's belongings. I decided to give everything my husband left, from his bank accounts to a pair of shoes, to his real daughter, Amiria. I hardly ever use the car myself. My husband wanted me to have it, but if you don't mind, would you take it too? The young couple exchanged glances and showed faces filled with joy. I truly wished that my husband's beloved daughter would continue to be happy forever. I strongly believed that Amiria and I would live harmoniously and support each other moving forward. Really? Thank you, Molly. Thank you, Mom. Her warm and caring words made me smile too. However, Amiria, who was occasionally teary-eyed yet smiling, suddenly turned serious and asked. Well, what about the house and the land? It seemed that Amiria was concerned because she couldn't find the deeds to the house and land. However, the house we started living in after getting married was actually my family home, originally inhabited by my parents. When my parents decided to move to another place, it naturally fell to me to take over the house. Surprised that Amiria had not known this fact, I decided to explain the situation calmly to her. That house was originally my family home. Both the land and the house are still in my parents' names. My parents are still well, and we won't be discussing inheritance for a while yet. Look. There they are over there. I pointed out my parents who had attended the funeral. Afterward, Amiria and Robert began whispering to each other, looking back. Clearly, they had misunderstood and thought they could inherit everything including the house and land. I was internally shocked when I saw Amiria's face contort into an unpleasant expression I had never seen before, reflected in the window glass. In the months that followed, communication from Amiria and her husband ceased, and although my messages were read, no replies came. 
However, three months later, Amiria suddenly visited, she was dressed very casually, and I was genuinely happy to see her face after such a long time. Furthermore, she brought some delightful news. I'm pregnant. I was so overjoyed by this news. When I learned that it was a life that was given to me not long after my husband died, I felt a new hope, as if he had been reborn. Congratulations, that's truly wonderful. If you need any help, just let me know. As I said this, I imagined the days ahead when Amiria and I would care for the baby together, and the fun we would have shopping. I had no hesitation about occasionally taking care of the baby to give a tired Amiria a break. I deeply wanted to be a wonderful grandmother. At that time, I couldn't have imagined that this dream would turn into regret. By the way, how many months pregnant are you now? Through this casual inquiry, I was made aware of a big misunderstanding. Amiria answered as if it was nothing. I'm almost seven months along. She said this while gently smoothing her hand over her loosely fitting maternity where to show me. I could see that her belly was clearly swollen. I hadn't noticed at the funeral three months ago, but she was already pregnant at that time. It wasn't a life conceived after my husband's death, rather, she had been pregnant while he was still battling his illness. I wished that my husband could have known this happy news during his lifetime. He had always said that he wanted to see his grandchild's face before he passed away. Unperturbed by my shock, Amiria made herself comfortable in the living room, and even after dinner, she showed no signs of leaving. Then, just past 8 p.m., Amiria suddenly said. I'm too tired to go home tonight. I'll stay here. Hope that's okay. I couldn't hide my surprise at this sudden statement. It wasn't a problem for her to stay, but I wondered where she planned to sleep. They had taken my husband's bed back with them, and the bed Amiria used in high school no longer existed. There's no bed here except my bed, what should we do? As I asked this, Amiria and Robert began whispering to each other. Amiria, reclining on the sofa and looking up at me standing, said without any hesitation. Then I'll sleep there. Robert says he'll sleep on this sofa. I was speechless, unable to say anything, as if the words were stuck in my throat. Her dignified behavior made me twist my head and be confused as to whether I was doing something wrong. In the meantime, what was Robert doing was just looking in a different direction in a sullen manner. Moreover, when he suddenly stood up, he opened the refrigerator without permission and began to look inside. Molly, do you have anything to drink? It would be great if you had some beer. I'd like something other than tea or water. Amiria seemed to agree with Robert's statement. Apparently, they were hinting that they wanted me to go out and buy something for them. Their presumptuous attitude left me utterly astonished. The couple left the next morning after having breakfast. They slipped out quietly without a single greeting while I briefly looked away. I spent some time looking for them because I couldn't see them anywhere. Amiria and Robert's sudden visits did not stop. They came almost every week, spending two or three days at my house. I bought an inflatable mattress for myself because it was troublesome to have my bed occupied every time. However, Robert took a liking to the mattress, and it ended up being taken by him. Consequently, on the days they visited, I had no choice but to sleep on the sofa. Honestly, this was quite a burden, However, I had already told them to let me know if there was anything I could help with, so it was difficult to refuse them. I screamed in surprise and shock when I saw Robert walking around the house completely drenched and naked after taking a shower. When I urged him to get dressed quickly, Amiria objected. Cut him some slack. Maybe it's because we're not real family that you feel less affection. 
Amiria used the fact that she was a stepchild to criticize me. Meanwhile, Robert was grinning creepily at a distance, saying nothing, just watching me unsettlingly. A little over three months passed, and Amiria's daughter, Emily, was safely born. Although we were not related by blood, I was delighted by the birth of my first grandchild and looked forward to the day Amiria would return home from the hospital. When I visited Amiria's home, she held Emily with a joyous expression and said to her, Look, Emily. There's a stranger here. Her words were teasing yet struck me like a deep wound. Following that, Robert added with a laugh. Hey, if you call her a stranger, you might lose the right to inherit the house. I felt extremely uncomfortable with his words, handed over the gift I had prepared, and quickly left the place. I felt that there was little chance of getting along with this couple. Before marriage, I was able to treat Amiria as a relatively normal girl, but lately I have felt a great distance. One month later, Amiria suddenly visited my house. She said three word at the door. Here you go. As she said this, Amiria handed me something that looked like a large bag. When I looked inside, there was baby Emily, sound asleep. It appeared the bag was being used as a baby basket. What? Am I supposed to take care of her? Are there diapers ready? Do you have milk? What time are you coming back? Despite these questions, Amiria and Robert didn't answer a word and just drove away. I waited for them to return, but they never did. Unable to go out with a baby that still couldn't support her own head, I had no choice but to ask for help from Lily. Lily bought the necessary supplies, and we managed to take care of the baby for the day, but I was completely exhausted both physically and mentally. I don't mind taking care of the child. However, being suddenly left with her for a whole day without any prior notice is unacceptable. At 8 p.m., Amiria and Robert finally returned home. Without a word of thanks or apology, Amiria took the child and immediately made another request. I'll be back on Monday, so take care of her again. I quickly stopped Amiria. Wait, Monday, the 16th, right? That's not possible. I have plans from morning to evening. Can't Robert's parents take care of her? Amiria briefly glanced at me and snorted disdainfully. Meanwhile, loud music blared from the car parked in front of the house and Robert didn't look our way at all. Fine. Her curt response did not alleviate my concerns. Still worried, I contacted Lily and discussed the situation with her. Lily responded after hearing my story. That's definitely a problem that your stepdaughter and her husband need to acknowledge. But you also need to assert yourself more clearly. You're being too accommodating to them, and that's the problem. But don't worry, if they do the same thing again, I'll speak to them firmly. Lily agreed to come to my house, and I expressed my gratitude over the phone, feeling extremely apologetic. Then, the dreaded Monday morning arrived. My fears materialized in the worst possible way. It was October, and as autumn deepened, the morning air had turned chilly. We spent that cold morning having breakfast, but then we thought we heard a faint sound, like the meowing of a kitten. Hey, it's coming from the front door. As we walked to the front door, the sound grew louder. The moment Lily cautiously opened the door, there was a baby basket placed all by itself. Seeing that familiar basket, I gasped. The next moment, Lily stepped outside and closed the door behind her, while I stood frozen inside. That's when I heard the sound of a car engine starting. I'm going on a trip, so please take care of Emily for a year, see you. As her loud voice faded away, I was so shocked that my legs buckled. After a while, 
Lily came back into the room with an indescribable expression. It looks like they were hiding in the car. But doesn't the baby seem very cold? It doesn't seem like she was in the car the whole time. We immediately looked into the basket and when I grasped Emily's tiny hand, it was chillingly cold and clearly exhausted from crying, with a runny nose. I tried to warm her up quickly, but it seemed better to head to the hospital right away. While waiting for the bill at the hospital's after-hours counter, we quietly discussed what to do next. And then, one year later. One day, I received a call from Amiria on my smartphone. Thank you so much for taking care of the baby for a whole year. Her words were light, as if we had just parted yesterday, and felt utterly weightless. Shortly after, Robert's voice was heard in the distance. I'm coming to pick the baby up now. I stepped back from the phone and covered my mouth as I took a deep breath. The moment I had long awaited had finally arrived. The time had come to say the line I had practiced every day for a year. What are you talking about? I don't know anything about the baby. My voice came out intentionally cold and extremely calm, a true reflection of my real anger. There had been absolutely no contact from Amiria and Robert for a whole year. Calls to the house phone and my smartphone were met only with automated messages. The number you have dialed is either out of reach or turned off. No matter what method I tried, I could not reach Amiria, and messages I sent remained unread, and letters sent to their home were probably still unopened. If they had seen even one of those, they might have known where I was now. On the other end of the phone, I heard Robert muttering. Was he trying to switch with Amiria, or just fumbling around? I waited patiently. Finally, Amiria started talking again. We left the baby at the front door, did we? She chuckled, seemingly unaware of the gravity of the situation. So, I continued with words that would bring her face to face with reality. What are you talking about? I'm not the one you entrusted Emily with. Don't you remember? With these words, I tried to make her realize the truth of the situation again. Reflecting back, the events of a year ago are unforgettable. The image of Emily left alone at the front door is seared into my memory. It was October 16th, an unforgettable major incident. Emily was so cold that Lily and I did not hesitate to rush her to the nearest hospital. When I explained the situation to the doctor, he was visibly shocked. Instead of handing over the baby, she was left directly on the cold concrete of the entrance. The doctor emphasized that such cooling of the body could not have occurred within just five or ten minutes. Emily was hospitalized for a day as a precaution, but fortunately, it was just a cold. However, the doctor noted that if she had been a weaker child, she might have been at risk of pneumonia or hypothermia. I still get chills down my spine when I think about what it would have been like if I had discovered it a little later. What are you talking about? I properly entrusted her to you one year ago. You're mistaken. Amiria stubbornly denied my words, her voice filled with anger and lowering in tone. I let out a long sigh and calmly retorted to her. You entrusted her to Aunt Lily, didn't you? On that day when I was supposed to be away, Aunt Lily came to stay and look after the house. Even though we are twins, it's impossible to mistake one for another after living together as a family for 12 years. After a brief silence, I could sense Amiria's confusion. She had hardly interacted with Lily, having met her only once at her father's funeral, and there had been almost no contact since. She might know Lily's name, but it's unlikely she remembers her appearance accurately. In reality, it is possible to tell us twins apart up close, and our hairstyles are notably different. My hair is cut short, while Lily has long hair. However, on the morning Emily was left, Lily had tied her hair back, 
making it hard to distinguish from my short style from a distance. Understanding these subtle differences, I decided to deliberately plan a misunderstanding based on these facts. This plan became the first step in our strategy. Amiria has always looked down on me, and Robert too seemed to think that anything is permissible within laws, leading him to underestimate me. At least, that's how we perceived their attitudes. What happens when a distant relative who doesn't usually interact steps in? Lily, while physically almost identical to me, has no personal connection with Amiria or Robert. They probably couldn't be as arrogant with her as they might be if I were present. The plan was for the stern Lily to give them a good scolding and make them reflect. I thought you entrusted Emily to Lily because you didn't trust me. I've only raised boys, but Lily has successfully raised three girls. From the fact that you told Emily I was a stranger, it's clear I'm disliked. I was disappointed to realize that. The moment to deploy what I had practiced had arrived. I was able to say this long speech smoothly without any help. As I spoke, I was also operating the computer. I was sending an email to Lily, who plays a very important role in this scheme. Then where is Emily? Isn't she at our place? If she still thinks she has Emily in her place, that's a very surreal idea. To this confusion, I had a solid answer. Emily is at Lily's house. After all, you entrusted her to Lily. As soon as Amiria heard my firm response, she let out a scream of astonishment. Why isn't she there? That makes no sense. I thought the house would be mine if Emily lived there. While trying to make sense of her mumbled words, a huge question mark hovered over my mind. What is she talking about? Where did she hear of a non-existent law that ownership could transfer based on Emily's residence? I wondered if this was some bizarre theory she had concocted on her own. It's fine, Molly, you're at the house now, right? We'll start by going there. She said this and hung up unilaterally. I hurriedly tried calling her back. Each ring felt abnormally long, and seconds seemed like eternity. I was worried she wouldn't answer, but fortunately, Amiria picked up after a few rings. I'm not there. I've moved out, I don't live in that house anymore. I quickly conveyed this fact, and Amiria responded with a surprised. What? I waited for her to ask something, but no further response came. I wanted to tell you this sooner, but I couldn't get in touch. Actually, I moved to take care of my parents in the apartment where they live. Thus, I clearly explained the situation to Amiria, trying to resolve her confusion. The reason I had told Amiria I would be out early in the morning a year ago was because I had a reason. That day, I had been called by my parents. My parents had built that family home, but after my father retired, they decided to move to a smaller apartment in the city. My father had injured his back, and with my mother too frail to support him alone, they needed my help. Why didn't you explain the situation sooner? After hearing the explanation, Amiria reproachfully questioned me. I initially thought I'd be back in about a week. But then it was a little longer, and before I knew it, a year had passed. But it was unavoidable, because my parents' mobility is gradually declining, and they need care. Originally, I was going to leave for a really short period of time, but I was sure that I would be living with them for a year unexpectedly. A drop of lies is that even when it was actually possible to return, there was no longer any intention to return to the original home. Amiria's departure from Emiri changed my way of thinking drastically. Fearing that as long as I stayed in this house, Amiria and Robert might repeat the same behavior again, Lily and I decided that it would be wise for us to change our location. This was our second plan, and the goal was to keep a reasonable distance from the spoiled partner and not to be around. Wait. 
So, nobody is living in that house now, right? Wow. Then we'll live there. Amiria spoke as if she suddenly realized, and there was a clear joy in her voice. Somehow, I wonder why her voice sounds so happy. At that moment, the voice of Robert was heard. Thank you so much. We'll take good care of that house. I frantically tried to correct them by waving my hands, then remembered I was on the phone and my gestures would not be seen. It felt incredibly frustrating not being able to have this conversation face to face. If possible, I'd fly to them right now to explain the situation. That's not correct. Lily is living in that house now. You should go and pick up Emily right away. She is there. Suddenly, there was a loud thud. It seemed Amiria had dropped her smartphone in shock. Perhaps she had received some explanation from Robert, but Amiria's voice was full of anger and could be heard faintly from a distance. And the phone was disconnected. I learned the details of this incident later from Lily. The characters involved were Lily, Emily, Amiria, and Robert. Lily has always been a reliable and strong presence, and her husband is calm and kind. About one hour after the call ended, Amiria and Robert visited the house where Lily and her husband live. They appeared suntanned and carried a carefree air, pulling suitcases decorated with stickers. It was infuriating to think about where they had been and why they left the baby, so much so that Lily felt compelled to confront them. Hey, why is someone else living in our house? Amiria shouted, her voice so loud that it made the ears of those around her ring. For Amiria, it must indeed feel like strangers are inhabiting her house. Lily is the rightful heir to the house, and it's only natural that she lives there. I was deeply disappointed that Amiria, due to her own narrow-mindedness, did not look at any other possibilities. This house was given to me as a living inheritance by our parents. Molly said, I've lived here long enough. It's about time I officially handed it over to Lily. That discussion took place about six months ago. Lily said these words with a happy smile. At that point, Lily knew from the information I had given her that the real purpose was that Amiria and Robert were trying to get hold of the house. Taking advantage of the fact that I used to live there, it became clear that them, who often visited, were actually looking for this house, and Lily decided that she should not be affectionate with them anymore. If it was based on family love, there might still have been room for tolerance, but since it was clearly an act aimed at property, Lily had no reason to be kind. So I asked my parents to change the name of this house to Lily. Why won't you give it to me? That's so cruel. Amiria, wearing her emotions on her sleeve, screamed in a raised voice. I couldn't understand why she was so fixated on this old house. Lily also found their way of thinking incomprehensible and sighed in disappointment. Why did you think you could get the house? It belongs to our parents, and they decide who inherits what. Think about it. You're not the one. If it's about being a grandchild, they have four blood-related grandchildren. There's no reason for you to be chosen. Amiria groaned in distress and lost her words. I'm concerned that Emily's name has never been mentioned before, but let's move on anyway. At this point, Lily continued to talk in more detail. Moreover, even if it were Molly's property, Molly has a son. Have you forgotten about your stepbrother? There's no way it could all be yours. Why are you so fixated on this old house anyway? At that moment, Robert leaked important information. This information was valuable to us, but it may not be something that Amiria want to know. Actually, there are plans to expand the road around here, which could be profitable. Wait, wait. 
Nodding in understanding, Lily realized the true reason behind Amiria and Robert's interest in the house. They were aiming for compensation money due to a road expansion project. It's new to us, but it's probably gossip he's heard at work, as Robert has a civil engineering job. There is currently no sidewalk on the road in front of the house, and that road is used as a route to school at a nearby elementary school, so it is a place where a surprisingly large number of cars pass. Maybe they're planning to install sidewalks. Even if this were the case, it would only be about one meter, but the government would pay a reasonable amount of compensation. Well, come on in for now. You'll want to see Emily, right? You're welcome to stay if you'd like. Lily said these words with a smile. Despite knowing the true plot of them, she carried out the third and final plan. We decided to take further corrective measures against Amiria and Robert. At this stage, Lily and her husband take the lead, and the goal is to discipline Amiria and Robert in particular and teach them to behave appropriately. In particular, Robert, despite being his in-laws, had no understanding of etiquette when visiting other people's homes, so it is here that the strict Lily inculcates him in proper behavior and guides him to behave politely. Amiria and Robert, having no way of knowing Lily's intentions, looked at each other and smiled as they walked into the house. Based on the strange idea that Amiria and Robert still have in their minds, that if they live there, they will get the house, they immediately begin to relax in the house. However, Lily is not the kind of person who misses such actions. For example, when Robert thoughtlessly walked around the house with his feet soaked after a bath, Lily immediately scolded him in a hoarse voice. What are you wearing? Where have your manners gone? How old do you think you are? Walking around wet is not acceptable. You are wetting the floors of someone else's house. Go change immediately and wipe up all the water droplets. Lily's stern reprimand echoed throughout the house, capturing everyone's attention. Being a mother of three and having experience as a physical education teacher, her scolding carried a lot of weight. Robert, used to a gentle mother-in-law who usually allows everything, was taken aback by this strict aunt who resembled her, blinking in confusion. Similarly, when Amiria was lounging sloppily in the living room, Lily swiftly approached and clapped her hands loudly. How long are you going to sit there? In our house, there's no food for those who don't work. Now, help out with some chores. With a firm attitude, Lily thoroughly taught Amiria how to do laundry and clean. Amiria was so reluctant that she cried, but these were actually very useful skills, making her enviable in a way. Lily herself is a versatile person who can handle anything and has very high domestic skills. I hope to learn some housekeeping tips from her someday. The biggest miscalculation for Amiria and Robert turned out to be Emily. Emily had not been mentioned before because there was a special reason. She saw Amiria and Robert as complete strangers and clung to her beloved grandpa, Lily's husband, refusing to leave the room. Emily, it's mommy, I'm back. When Amiria approached warmly with her arms open, Emily started to cry intensely out of fear. This was an understandable reaction. For Emily, who was left behind soon after birth, Amiria was now completely a stranger at the age of one. As for Robert, any attempt to approach made Emily cry even more, deeply hurting him. He imagined a happy reunion as a father, but he felt despair at the reality that Emily was not nostalgic at all. At the end of the sentence, he looked at Emily with cold eyes. This isn't Emily, is it? With this comment, Robert further angered Lily. Amiria and Robert mistakenly believed that Emily would love and long for them, but this was completely misunderstood. It's astonishing that they consider it normal to neglect someone for such a long time. After Emily gets tired of crying and retreats to the bedroom with Lily's husband, 
Lily decides to show Amiria and Robert a photo that records Emily's growth so far. The album contains many adorable images of Emily who are always smiling, and the process of growing up from a squishy baby to the current one with clear eyes is firmly preserved. For a child just over a year old, a year is almost a lifetime. Even though you are her parents, she can't possibly remember you. What do you expect from Emily in such a short time? While Lily spoke rationally, Amiria and Robert, having gone through the photo album showing Emily's growth, were left speechless and silently shedding tears. Perhaps for the first time, they truly realized that their pursuit of entertainment and monetary desires had sacrificed irreplaceable time with their child. If they change their mind at this moment and everything goes well, it will be a beautiful ending. In reality, however, it is not so easy. Because my sanction against Amiria and Robert had not yet been completed. Lily is a character who will never forgive her for acting disrespectfully, and Emily will not forgive her for her lack of affection that should be shown to her either. And as a parent myself, I can't forgive Amiria and the others for putting young Emily in danger. Therefore, the next morning, I went to Lily's house accompanied by several people. This visit, of course, was fully approved by Lily. That day was a cold October. Leaving a young child at the front door is not an act that can be forgiven. The doctor who treated her said the same, it was a situation so dangerous that a tragic accident could have occurred. As I explained this, I pressed the doorbell, and Lily opened the door. The people accompanying us presented their police badges. I brought the police officers with me. When Lily and I took care of Emily safely, we immediately consulted with the police. At that time, he had been advised that the situation was likely to be legally problematic, so he contacted the police again and asked them to come to visit the two people who had returned home. That morning, Amiria and Robert, who had not been on any precautions, were having breakfast when we suddenly appeared. What was that action back then? Why did you leave Emily in such a cold place? The doctor said it would have been very dangerous if her body temperature had dropped any further. I have to question if you are truly fit to be parents. My voice trembled with anger because, according to Lily, the two had been enjoying themselves in Hawaii for a year, during which they even conceived another child, and Amiria is now four months pregnant. Robert was shocked to hear that Emily's situation had been more dangerous than he thought but Amiria immediately resumed her high-handed attitude upon seeing me. Really, you are annoying. We wanted to have fun too. It's your fault for saying you couldn't take her. Cold? That's on you. After saying this, Amiria reached out to a frightened Emily, but the police quickly grabbed her hand and stopped her. The officers introduced themselves and explained calmly why they were there while I listened intently. Amiria, realizing she might be arrested, panicked and began screaming and thrashing. She was firmly restrained by the police officers, both male and female, and pleaded for help from me on the spot. I just bit my lip and turned my face away. Amiria and Robert, though not blood-related, had been considered important family members for a long time. However, I could not forgive their treatment of Emily. Meanwhile, Robert tried to escape from the scene but was quickly caught by the police and pinned to the ground. The two were then placed in a patrol car and taken to the police station. About two months later, the verdict in Amiria and Robert's trial was announced. Due to the extremely malicious nature of their actions and the lack of sincere remorse, they were sentenced to a long period of incarceration. Although there was some evidence of remorse due to Emily and Lily's intervention, their disdainful attitude after being arrested gave a very bad impression to the judge, leading to a harsh sentence. Furthermore, during the trial, they blamed each other, which deepened their discord and led to a divorce. 
Amiria gave birth to a child in prison, which was initially placed in a child care facility, but later I took in. Amiria now cries daily over her mistakes and deeply regrets them, but she has to face the consequences of her actions. Robert, similarly, deeply regrets his actions and is genuinely remorseful. Robert's parents have apologized, but it seems they have ultimately decided to disown their son. After his release, Robert faces a lonely and uncertain future. A year has passed, and I have taken in the children born to Amiria and Robert. My son has returned from the city, and together with my parents, we all live together in a large house. As a family, we started a new life supporting each other. Lily and her husband, as well as Robert's parents, have been very supportive, making this new phase of childcare go smoothly. Especially, I've developed a good friendship with Robert's mother, who is close to my age. Sometimes, when I send cute photos of the grandchildren, she replies with adorable cat pictures. With a desire to create a nurturing environment for the grandchildren, I incorporate various ideas daily and make creative adjustments. Recently, to teach them compassion, we started growing flowers together. I look forward to the days we can care for the plants with love, growing alongside them. Amiria and Robert are still serving time in prison. Because of this, Emily now calls my son a dad and me a grandma. Eventually, they will need to be told about their biological parents, but for now, I want them to grow up feeling unconditionally loved. The second child I've taken in is a boy, and Emily, though young, is already playing her role as a caring older sister well. When her brother cries, she gently approaches, pats him softly, and watches over him with concern, which is incredibly heartwarming. Living with my grandchildren, who are loved unconditionally, brings me immeasurable happiness every day. Life surrounded by their smiles is fulfilling every day, and I cherish every moment. Why not just live there forever? I was cradling my baby and deeply focused on organizing the old shed in our backyard. My husband, with a smile, locked the door and silently left the area. Why are you doing this? Open the door quickly. In the sudden darkness, the only sound I could hear was the sad crying of my three-month-old baby. I was about to cry with worry, but I felt a strong sense of duty to protect this little one. Time passed, and as I gradually calmed down, anger towards my husband began to rise from the depths of my heart. I could never forgive him, a strong resolution grew inside me. I vowed to carry out my revenge thoroughly. Growing up, I had always followed the path set by my parents. That's why I deeply wished for my younger sister, Hannah, who is six years younger, to live freely by her own will. I had given up my own dreams, chosen the educational path my parents desired, and even my spouse was not my choice. I met my husband Kevin through an arranged meeting facilitated by our parents. He was quiet and considerate, and I remember having a good impression of him. Kevin is a solid and good man. Supporting someone like him suits Sally very well. With strong encouragement from my parents, the marriage was promptly arranged. After deciding to marry, things moved smoothly, unfolding at the pace of an escalator ride. My husband had already lost his parents, and after marriage, we lived in his house. The house was, to put it positively, blessed with nature, to put it negatively, somewhat remote in the countryside. Our home was on a large property, with a substantial shed built some distance from the house. The area around the shed was quiet, the nearest neighbor quite far away, and it was mostly free from pedestrian traffic. Having lived in the city before, I had some anxiety about adapting to such a quiet and expansive environment. In contrast, my cheerful and energetic younger sister, Hannah, always supported me. There's no worry about living within laws, and living in a rent-free house sounds really great, doesn't it? 
Well, that's true, but I'm still worried about a lot of things. Try to live a bit easier. I'm always here to listen, and I'll come to visit sometimes too. Encouraged by Hannah, I decided to approach life in the countryside with a positive attitude. However, once I started living with Kevin, it became clear that he wasn't accustomed to household chores. He had been living alone in this house since his parents passed away, and I heard that the house was quite messy and he relied on eating out or supermarket meals. I imagined it must have been difficult to keep this large house clean amidst a busy work schedule, but gradually, I started creating a comfortable environment for myself. I really appreciate you organizing the house, Sally. Your home cooking is delicious, and I always look forward to coming home from work. Hearing him say this made me feel very happy, and it gave me even more motivation in my daily chores. Soon after, I received some joyful news. I was pregnant. Kevin, I'm pregnant. I found out at the doctor's today, I'm already seven weeks pregnant. Is that so? That's great. Congratulations. When I shared the joy of pregnancy with Kevin, his surprisingly calm demeanor contrasted sharply with my overflowing happiness. His lack of enthusiasm raised some slight worries in me. Why doesn't he seem very happy? Unable to bear the thought alone, I decided to discuss my worries with my younger sister Hannah, who worked as a preschool teacher. Men often take longer to feel like parents since they don't experience physical changes. Is that normal? Yes, many husbands who are frequently cautioned by their wives about their children are just like that. Hearing her words made me feel somewhat relieved. So, I decided to try to make Kevin feel more excited about our child's birth by showing him the ultrasound photos after my prenatal visits. I also made it a point to carefully explain the baby's growth as I learned from the doctor. This is the baby's face, and these are its little feet. Really? That's amazing. His reaction wasn't that enthusiastic, but I was grateful he listened, and I hoped that over time I could gradually draw his interest. However, my small hope was easily shattered in an unexpected way. Sally, this is no time to be lying down, get the bath ready. I'm really struggling with morning sickness today and can't move. Kevin, I'm sorry, but could you prepare the bath? Why do I have to do that? Isn't that your role to handle these household tasks? My health was unstable during pregnancy and I continued to feel unwell. Amidst this, Kevin began to push even more household responsibilities onto me. I understood that he was working hard outside, but I deeply wished he would at least offer some kind words or comfort. Unfortunately, Kevin increasingly vented his work pressures and stress at me. Your gloomy face is making it hard for me to focus at work. Show me a brighter smile. I can't do anything about that when you talk to me like this. I could tolerate his harsh words, but at times he would push me or throw things in anger, and I found myself instinctively protecting my belly. The fear that such behavior might continue even after our child was born haunted me. As a wife with such a husband, I felt anxious every day, but I didn't want to worry my family, so I kept my troubles to myself. I also didn't want to create a situation where my child would grow up without a father, so I endured the tough circumstances. Months later, a healthy boy was born, whom we named Devin. First-time parenting was more challenging than expected, and I was constantly referring to parenting books and trying different approaches. Devin won't stop crying. Kevin, could you hold him for just a little while? Calming the child is the mother's responsibility. Don't push everything onto me. Kevin continued to show a reluctant attitude towards cooperation, evidently considering child rearing the responsibility of women. Hurry up and get dinner ready. I'm starving. Even while I was nursing Devin, Kevin would complain about his own hunger, prioritizing his needs over those of our child. 
I wondered to myself, when will he start to feel the responsibilities of a full-fledged father? Far from showing any signs of becoming a father, Kevin began coming home later and started taking solo camping trips on weekends, frequently leaving the house empty. With frequent childcare duties disrupting my sleep, I honestly didn't have the energy to address my husband's self-centered behavior. It was on such a day that Kevin made a gruff demand while I was busy cleaning up the kitchen. I left some work documents in the car. Can you go get them? At that moment, I was busy cleaning the kitchen and needed to change Devin's diaper soon. Get them yourself. I need to take care of Devin now. It's just a small thing. They're on the passenger seat, so just go quickly and get them. Despite my internal resistance, I went to his car to avoid further argument reluctantly. As I opened the door, a strong scent of feminine perfume wafted out. What? Why is it such a strong smell? While thinking this, I grabbed the documents as directed and was about to close the door when something shiny under the passenger seat caught my eye. What is this? Why is this in the car? It was a small, cute earring that clearly wasn't mine. Hey, Kevin, have you been giving someone a ride in the car? I handed him the documents while casually asking him as if it just occurred to me, keeping my suspicions to myself. What's that about? No way, of course not. His voice carried its usual sternness, but there was a hint of panic, and he avoided making eye contact with me. I see. I was just curious. Sorry for the odd question. I did not delve further into the subject at that moment, but deep down, I harbored strong suspicions about his unfaithful behavior. Finding spare moments, I decided to subtly investigate his actions. Time passed, and Devin was now three months old, his neck firm enough to allow for outings using a baby carrier and managing household chores. I decided it was time to sort out the long-neglected shed on our property, cradling Devin as I went about organizing the clutter. Suddenly, the sound of the shed door slamming shut echoed. What's happening? Why not just live there forever? He locked the door with a sarcastic laugh, trapping me inside the shed. Wait, open the door. I pounded on the door and cried out desperately, but Kevin had already gotten into his car and drove off the property quickly. Why is he doing this? Confused, I couldn't take any action. I had carelessly left my smartphone in the living room and now in the shed, I could only hear Devin crying. However, this was no time for despair. With a strong determination to protect my son, I began to desperately search for anything useful in the dim shed, using the little light that filtered in. Then, a thought struck me. Having experienced an earthquake before, I had made sure to prepare emergency supplies when I got married. Especially since I had trouble when communications were cut off last time, I had packed a prepaid smartphone in my backpack just in case. I never imagined it would be useful in such a situation. I quickly found the phone, charged it with a spare battery, and dialed my sister's number from memory. Hello, Hannah. It's urgent, can you come right now? I'm locked in the shed and can't get out. What happened, Sally? Are you okay? I can't explain everything now, but please hurry. I'm worried about Devin too, come quickly. Fortunately, Hannah arrived quickly, and we were finally able to escape to the outside. Prioritizing my son's safety, I had momentarily forgotten about my husband, but talking with Hannah helped me regain my composure, and my anger towards him grew gradually. I can never forgive Kevin. I will definitely get revenge. That sounds good, Sally. I'll support you no matter what. Feeling Hannah's strong support, I resolved to exact revenge on my husband and began to plan. To locate him, I made an important phone call related to him. Days passed, 
and I left my son with my parents, waiting quietly at home for Kevin's return. Near noon, he finally returned home. I heard the sound of him closing the car door and his humming as he walked towards the house, seemingly in a good mood. Hey, I'm home. Make lunch quickly. I'm starving. As soon as he entered the front door, he loudly demanded food. It seemed he had completely forgotten that he had locked me in the shed. I hid in a hiding spot in the living room, quietly watching his movements. Hey, where are you? Aren't you here? Where did you go? My husband paced around irritably, unable to hide his frustration at my lack of response. Then, the sound of the intercom ringing halted his steps, and he moved towards the front door. Hi Kevin, is Sally here? It seems she's not home right now. Is that so? I've been worried because I haven't been able to contact her for a few days. Outside, my sister, waiting, asked Kevin as if she didn't know anything. Her acting was perfect. Haven't been able to contact her for a few days? Oh, I just remembered. He suddenly remembered what he had done and hurried toward the shed. Meanwhile, I observed him from my hiding place in the living room, peeking through the curtain gap. What? What is this? He noticed a red liquid spilling out from the shed and recoiled in shock, retreating a few steps. Cautiously, he touched the shed door, hesitating a moment before slowly trying to open it. Kevin encountered a strong odor coming from the shed and grimaced, feeling nauseous on the spot. Damn, what is this stench? He couldn't stand the bad smell and covered his mouth and nose with his hands. It's okay. Everything is going as planned. I signaled to Hannah with my eyes, and she took a moment to look over quietly to make sure Kevin hadn't noticed her. What does this mean? Sally is in there? No, no, that can't be. Then let me check. Move aside. Hannah's tense acting overpowered Kevin, and she pressed him to open the shed door. Wait, Hannah. Let's calm down. Desperately, my husband tried to prevent the opening of the shed door, but Hannah brushed aside his resistance and managed to open the door and step inside. Sally! Hey! Don't shout like that. Oh, what should we do? We need to call an ambulance and the police right away. No, that's not necessary. Hannah's performance was worthy of a leading actress, and the scene was filled with tension. Kevin, look carefully. This is really serious. Prompted by Hannah, my husband peeked into the shed with a nervous look. What? What is this? He exclaimed in shock and quickly backed out of the shed. Why has this happened? My. My. What, exactly? I emerged from my hiding place outside, pretending to know nothing and tapped Kevin on the shoulder lightly. He turned around, his eyes wide with surprise and completely bewildered. Oh God. I'm so sorry, really sorry. He rubbed his hands together, lost for words, and apologized repeatedly in a trembling voice. It was as if he thought I was a ghost or something. Are you saying sorry for what you did to your precious wife and child? Yes, that's right. He couldn't hide his panic and hastily nodded in agreement with my words. But I don't intend to forgive you. I will never forgive you. As I approached him and tried to grab his shoulder, he flinched and tried to push my hand away. Warm. You're alive? Now coming to his senses, Kevin reached down to touch the liquid that had spilled on the ground, tentatively checking the red fluid. This isn't blood. Finally understanding the situation, he glared at me furiously. You did this. You ruined my precious camping gear. In fact, as part of my revenge, 
I had placed rotten meat and poured a blood-like red liquid on his beloved camping gear, making it seem like it spilled out from the shed. Thought something terrible had happened to me, didn't you? Surprised? Sally, Kevin was totally panicking with the smell and the blood-like liquid. That's right, he's usually so bold, but this time he was really pitiful, wasn't he? Why, why would you? Faced with my words, Kevin was visibly angry and confused. He was unable to respond to my cutting remarks, and all he could do was bite his lip. What a pity. This tent, the smell is so ingrained it seems unusable now. No matter how much you wash it, that smell won't come out, will it? That's not funny. Do you know how much I cared for this? Who do you think caused this mess? He approached me, trembling with anger. Is that tent more important to you than me and Devin? That's not what I'm saying. But if you hadn't let us out of the shed, things could have been much worse. We might have even ended up at the police station. I expressed my thoughts to my husband more clearly than ever before. He seemed confused by my reaction and appeared to have lost the power to argue back. But my plan was not yet complete. So, where were you while we were locked in the shed? Having fun forgetting you'd locked us in? I told you, I was busy with work. You seemed really busy, especially the meeting with Lily. It looked like it went well. How do you know about Lily? His face showed shock the moment I mentioned her name. I wonder why. Think about it. Hold on, are you mocking me? I'm not mocking you. I just think you're really foolish. Since finding a woman's earring in Kevin's car, I had harbored suspicions about his fidelity and began to gather solid evidence of his infidelity. The first clue was his tablet, which he hadn't used much recently. I remembered he used it to access the Messages app when his smartphone was being repaired about six months ago, thinking there might be a clue there. Sure enough, the message app was active, and there were messages saved between him and a woman named Lily. From those messages, it was clear she worked at the same place as Kevin. I had secretly watched his activities around his workplace a few times. My suspicions were confirmed when I saw Kevin and Lily leaving the office together, walking closely into a brightly lit hotel. This is the proof. I showed Kevin a photo of them entering the hotel. This isn't what it looks like. It just happened that we were going the same way, and she said she felt ill, so we went in there to rest. Hearing Kevin's feeble excuse, Hannah interrupted him and retorted. You went to a hotel because of that? I don't know what happened inside, but anyone can make that excuse. Hannah, can you keep it down a bit? I can't be quiet. I can't forgive you for hurting Sally so much. Hannah expressed her anger more vividly than I felt, not hiding her outrage at my husband. Here's further proof. Next, I showed Kevin a printout of the conversations between him and his affair partner. The tablet you hardly looked at has ironically ended up in our hands like this. My sarcastic comment clearly filled him with anger, and he approached me aggressively. Snooping around someone's private life is a disgraceful act. Instead of apologizing, he lashed out in anger, but I was unmoved by his attitude. If you wanted to hide something, you should have deleted it properly. That was careless of you. He was indignant at my words, but couldn't hide his regret. Also, did you enjoy the trip you planned over message? Yes, it was much better than staying at home with you. It's always about the kid, and I'm just ignored. He finally revealed his true feelings and admitted to his affair trip. Unbelievable. You are so self-centered. Always thinking you're the most important, typical man. Really pathetic. Faced with Hannah's blunt words, Kevin had no reply and fell silent. I smiled at my sister, 
grateful for her support. And thus, my revenge against my husband moved into its final phase. You lied to your company that Devin and I were sick to take a day off, right? How can you be okay with that? How do you know about that? I asked someone at your company. No way. I had called his workplace pretending to know nothing about him taking a trip with his mistress while supposedly off work. They said you were on carer's leave. But in reality, Devin and I were perfectly healthy. They were quite surprised when I told them that. Why would you, why would you do that? Because lying is wrong. I made sure to tell them that you were busy with your affair. Wait, just tell them I was nursing you and that you were delirious with fever. Please correct it. He pleaded with me in panic and fear. I can't lie about that. It's your responsibility to us. I firmly refused his plea, but Kevin desperately continued to appeal. But if I get disciplined at work, you and Devin can't live. What will you do then? Don't worry about us. It's over between us. We are strangers now. What do you mean? Without a word, I presented him with the divorce papers. I will be claiming alimony and child support. Be prepared. My definitive statement left Kevin utterly defeated, collapsing on the spot. Our divorce was finalized shortly after, and I decided to sue for damages due to his infidelity. I sought $15,000 in compensation for his affair and $2,000 per month for child support. Additionally, I demanded $4,000 from his mistress as compensation. Their inappropriate relationship within the company was seen as disruptive and Kevin, in particular, was severely penalized for falsifying a nursing leave. His mistress resigned due to the scandal, while Kevin was transferred to a remote branch of the company. His dishonorable actions were already known at his new location, making his days there extremely difficult. Despite the challenging circumstances, he had no choice but to continue working there to meet his financial obligations. As for me, I moved back to my parents' home temporarily. Currently, I'm focusing on finding a nursery for Devin and searching for a new job to provide a stable and happy life for my son. My primary goal is to support and raise my son in happiness.